Hey, what's up? Hey. Finally, we get to the second chapter of this book. This little essay right here is called America Seen Through Photographs Darkly. In the first few pages, Sontag weaves a link between Walt Whitman, the 19th century American poet, Alfred Stieglitz, who was instrumental in how photography was perceived as art in the United States. She also writes about Edward Steichen, a famous photographer in his own right and a close associate to Stieglitz, Walker Evans, and Diane Arbus. These are all names I was vaguely familiar with from when I first studied photography in 07. I'm a little embarrassed to admit that I was never all that thrilled with the photos I had seen of Stieglitz, Evans, or Arbus for that matter. I think I was too young. Steichen seemed vaguely more interesting, but that was because I thought I wanted to be a fashion photographer. <laughs> I always try to keep that first encounter with this medium as fresh as possible, not out of nostalgia, but rather to stay in touch with that sense of innocence with which most non-photographers look at photography. So why this autobiographical rambling? Well, because coincidentally it ties with the idea that Sontag opens this chapter with. Quote, as Walt Whitman gazed down the democratic vistas of culture, he tried to see beyond the difference between beauty and ugliness, importance and triviality. It seemed to him servile or snobbish to make any discrimination of value except the most generous ones." End quote. I'm not going to try to summarize Whitman's ginormous vision here, it's well beyond my, the scope of my YouTube channel, and well beyond Sontag's essay for that matter. So. In plain English, <laughs> Whitman promoted the appreciation and celebration of life in its infinite shades, free of any judgment of what is worth paying attention to. This is something I briefly kind of spoke about when, in episode 8 when talking about Wolfgang Tillmans' choice of subject matter for the Fruit Logistica project. Time stamped up here. Sontag presents Edward Steichen's 1915 photograph of a milk bottle as an early example of a new idea of how a photograph can be beautiful. After playing around with the notion of how American photography has gone from affirmation to erosion to finally parody of Whitman's motto, she calls Stieglitz's efforts with camera work and 291 the most ambitious forum of Whitmanesque judgments. Stieglitz was one of the hardest working and most influential figures of the photographic scene at the turn of the century in the United States. He was born in New Jersey in 1864 to a very wealthy family and moved to Europe with them when he was 15, and that's where he picked up photography. A few years later, he went back to the States, and by 1902, he decided to work on his own publication, camera work, which contained very very high quality prints, and he did a lot of writing. The writing was very good as well. Three years later, he opened a gallery on Fifth Avenue called Little Galleries of the Photo Succession, later named simply 291. So why does Sontag present an image from 1915 as an early example of the Whitman ideal if Stieglitz had been hard at work for well over a decade by then? Well, most of Stieglitz's efforts until 1915 were centered around the pictorialist aesthetic, and most of the work promoted by camera work and 291 was of this ilk. The pictorialists were characterized by this romantic capture of subject matter, highlighting its beauty through highly technical execution or just messing around with the print in the darkroom sometimes, rather than adopting a more realist approach like Steichen did for that 1915 picture. This more modern aesthetic caught Stieglitz's eye around that time, pretty much after meeting Paul Strand and getting acquainted with his style, which concentrated on the bold lines of everyday forms. Shortly after meeting Strand, Stieglitz met and fell in love with Georgia O'Keeffe, and he made a few changes to his creative endeavors, <laughs> which included closing down the gallery and not publishing camera work anymore. Now, I have read a few of the articles of camera work, but I didn't have in mind this Whitmanesque idea, so I was a bit intrigued as to why Sontag deems Stieglitz's early contributions the most ambitious forum of Whitmanesque judgments. Quote, like Whitman, Stieglitz saw no contradiction between making art an instrument of identification with the community and aggrandizing the artist as a heroic romantic, self-expressing ego." End quote. The only indication Sontag gives of, this, of his actual photographic work being Whitman-esque, my apologies for the repeated use of this word, I know it just sounds really contrived, but I just want to be faithful to the way Sontag writes about this. So yes, Sontag only uses a quote by 
Paul Rosenfeld from 1924 to illustrate how Stieglitz's photos are in the spirit of Whitman. But she doesn't really delve in on how we can reconcile both Stieglitz's pictorialist efforts and Walker Evans's anti-art realism as both being examples of this same idea in the way Walt Whitman presents it. Let's take Winter Fifth Avenue from 1893 as an example of the pictorialist approach. Stieglitz's own description of the process and his three-hour wait for the quote-unquote balance makes me not agree with calling the pictorialist approach Whitman-esque. Jesus, I'm, I'm sorry. I I wish there was a different word. In fact, it seems to be the opposite, a highly selective and controlled way of making images. Right after talking about Stieglitz, Sontag places Walker Evans as the direct successor to carry over with this American philosophy. I do feel that Evans, even for today's standards, is one of those artists that elevated every single subject matter equally to a podium. He has been one of the hardest photographers for me to understand and actually enjoy. In his work, the points of interest are not always obvious. Um, his sober approach to black and white as well, it just, it's kind of really hard to enjoy for the contemporary eye. I've always loved the way Gary Winogram described him in this lecture. At least in terms of my experience, Evans's work was radically different. Evans is a very special photographer, you know, you, you uh, you study study his work. You know it's um, you know he's probably for my you know for my money he's probably the most transparent photographer. You know the only other one who would, who would, I would say that about is Ache and, and Ache's work winds up, still winds up being characterized by the materials he used in terms of his time. So it's living. Uh, in the end, he doesn't completely get out of the way, but Evans, more than anybody else, gets out of the way. Um, it's, it's almost, it's as close to the absence of, a strat of an obvious strategy that I, that I know of. But the, you know the voice is always evident. He's a, you know just a great artist. He's a great artist. He's a great work. You're talking about the way he can work with both. I didn't say that. No, no, no. You mean I mean he's not arty. You know, look, look. All right, look, look at that. Look at look at uh, Weston for one, right? And Weston is arty. I'm not saying he's not. He's, he didn't do great work, but he is arty. It's about making art. And you take somebody like Robert Frank, who is 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 probably most obviously, and I can't be, listen to my words, most obviously antithetical to that. Robert Frank's strategy is about, you know, a kind of s casualness. The things look like they're made easily. It's the opposite of audiness, in a, in a very obvious way. Yet. It's self-defeating. It's his oddy. In, in, in the end, it's as much a strategy as Weston's. Look at Evans. And it's, it really is as close, to, as close to the absence of a strategy as I can imagine, as I know of. Am I making it clear? I mean, look at the work, what I'm talking about. You know, That's what I'm talking about. It's not a question of what camera he used. It really didn't matter. It is about, the, it, it is, the, the, there is, it's as close to the absence of a strategy. The Doesn't that become the strategy? Oh, sure, it's as much a strategy. I'm not, really, but it really is, I, I, I would use the word transparent, where, where in the end, Frank isn't transparent and, and Weston isn't. He is, he's as close to being transparent, to being, to not existing, yet, boy, does he exist. I'm, you know, in the best way. That's what I'm talking about. You know, what do you want to say? Sontag contextualized one of Evans's most famous ambitions when it came to his work. Quote, Evans wanted his photographs to be literate, authoritative, transcendent. The moral universe of the 1930s being no longer ours, these adjectives are barely credible today. Nobody demands that photography be literate. Nobody can imagine how it could be authoritative. Nobody understands how 
anything, least of all a photograph, could be transcendent. End quote. Again, Sontag was talking about the 1977 zeitgeist here, but she seems to be talking about the 2020s. It's quite eerie. Her standards must have been pretty high as well because the 1970s were one of the best times to be a photographer. Like Gary Winogrand and Lee Friedlander were at the top of their games. And then John Tarkovsky was the director of the MoMA. And then Stephen Shore had just had that massive show at the Met. I mean, I think it's one of the best times to, to be a photographer or to practice photography. She also thinks of how a show organized by Steichen in 1955 was part of a successful continuation of the Whitman idea. Family of Man presented 503 photographs by 273 photographers from 68 countries that were meant to prove that humanity is one and that human beings, for all their flaws and villainies, are attractive creatures." End quote. This show is often cited along with new documents held 12 years later as milestones in the history of photography in America. Sontag moves from a brief mention of Steichen to a long bitter tirade against Diane Arbus. Quote, the pious uplift of Steichen's photograph anthology and the cool dejection of the Arbus retrospective both render history and politics irrelevant. One does so by universalizing the human condition into joy, the other by atomizing it into horror. She's actually writing here about Arbus's posthumous retrospective held in 1972 one year after she committed suicide. Arbus' work is really divisive, and this controversy is part of what keeps it relevant even today. I've gone through different periods of being repelled by and feeling affection towards it. When I first saw it, um, I actually found it kind of uninteresting because it seemed to me that its main focus was how unique or unusual her subjects were. And I thought that this is something that photography doesn't do beautifully or in an interesting way. It gave me a similar feeling to those photographers that only shoot really beautiful people with really beautiful light, except she does the complete opposite. So yeah, I will explore this Sontag Arbus relation in more detail in the next episode. There's a lot to unpack here. It's all very subjective and there's no right or wrong and there's so many factors at play. So stay tuned, like, subscribe, all that. Okay, see ya.